My name is H.P. Lim, and I'm Director of Supervision at the FSRA. So the purpose of this webinar today is to share the FSRA's view of risk and our expectations regarding the risk management systems and controls of our authorized firms. So we also share at a high level the framework and methodology that the FSRA uses to risk rate our authorized firms. Now we do recognize that there is no one size fit, fits all approach to risk management and each firm given its own unique circumstances and risk profiles, um, you will likely adopt varying risk management practices depending on your own needs. Um, nonetheless, we do think that there are certain um, general principles and practices of risk management that are likely to be highly relevant and applicable to most firms, uh, which is why we are sharing this information to you um, through this presentation today, and we hope you find it useful. Um, please note that this presentation is not meant to be official guidance or advice from the FSRA. Um, if you have any specific risk management questions or issues you'd like to discuss with us, uh, please reach out to the FSRA separately. Next slide, please. So this is the agenda for today. Um, I will be covering items one and two before handing over to my colleague, uh, Darren Williams from the Supervision Division. Um, after that, we will end with a Q&A session with Darren, myself, and uh, our colleague, John Carroll from the Legal Division. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, the FSRA has a number of regulatory objectives, and these are enshrined in the Financial Services and Markets Regulations on Chapter 1. So we, we are showing some of these objectives on this slide. And, and for us, you know, the failure of our firms to, to control for and mitigate their risks can directly impede the achievement of some of these objectives, which is precisely why the FSRA views um, risk and risk management practices of our firms um, so seriously. Uh, next slide, please. And as an authorized firm, uh, when you design your risk management framework and you're thinking about how to go about doing it, um, we think it can be helpful to focus on, on the key areas outlined um, on this slide. Uh, my, my colleague, Darren Williams, he will cover these points in more detail in, in the following slides, but this can be a starting point for you to start to conceptualize and design your risk management framework. Now, I think all of us, we each have our own idea and understanding of what risk means. But I think it's helpful to have a, a definitional discussion of what risk is. And for that, um, my colleague Darren will, will, will start talking about this. Uh, over to you, Darren. As alluded to, my name is Darren Williams. I'm the senior manager in FSRA supervision. And now, it seems we've already discussed risk from a regulatory perspective, I wanted to dive down in terms of what do we mean by risk. So unfortunately, there's lots and lots of definitions of risk, but three ones I decided to pick out, which I thought might be useful to illustrate this point. The first one is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So when you look at a risk, you have to determine what's the risk of, what are we talking about? So it's got to be something aligned to the strategy, the objectives, the intentions, or the objectives, or the activity of a firm. The next two definitions are common definitions and methods of assessment for risk. So it's a product of impact and probability relating to a possible harm. So when we talk about impact, we talk about the consequences of the risk materializing. When we talk about probability, it's the likelihood, percentage-wise or time-wise, that the risk will materialize. Next slide, please. So to take this to a more practical level, um, this is a framework I've used with other institutions in the UK to help them start to define their risks. So it's cause, event, effect. So what do we mean? So for example, the failure to provide training on the confidential and inside information could lead to an inadvertent data breach, the effect of which could result in legal or regulatory action against that person. So just to remember that when an issue arises in a firm, these are the type of questions that a supervisor is likely to ask. And it's important for a firm that when an issue arises, they look to see what the possible causes were, whether this could have been an occurrence that happens elsewhere in the organisation, and the possible effect in terms of lessons learned and impact on stakeholders, customers and reputation. Next slide, please. So there are a number of different risk types, and here's just an illustration 
of some of the key risks, both from an external and internal perspective. Now, this will vary according to the type and sophistication of the organization. For a bank, it will be the classic credit risk, liquidity risk, and market risk. Two areas I think are quite important for AGM firms in terms of uh, if they're a startup or new to the center is business risk in terms of the risk to their strategy, the risk to delivery of their business plan, and also human resources risk. So when you're a startup, it's important that you have the right people in terms of quantity and quality in place to deliver your strategy. Next slide, please. Obviously, it's important that when we talk about risk from a regulatory perspective, there's a different view on risk, a business view on risk. It's important to realize that risk is a factor of the business and is also an opportunity for the business. However, it's important that the business takes the right level of risk. Holding lots of capital, holding lots of liquidity could be very safe from a prudential perspective, but excessive levels mean you don't have sufficient return on your assets or your equity. However, excessive risk taking could lead to the failure or risk of a business continuing. Next slide, please. Regulators have their own approach to assessing risks, and we adopt a risk-based approach, which means we concentrate our resources on the risk to the mitigation of risk to our objectives. We focus on a proportionate manner on the key risks in our sector. The FSOA risk assessment is based on a combination of the firm's size and complexity, which we call the impact rating, and its risk profile probability. And it's a combination of these which leads to an overall risk assessment. We assess firms in five key areas, business risk, financial crime, operational risk, oversight and controls, and financial mitigation. In terms of business risk, we examine, for example, to see what the business model and strategy of a firm is. How does it make its money? How is it set up in its operating model? Its conduct risk, how does it interact and treat its customers? Obviously, with the National Risk Assessment and FATF assessments, financial crime is very high on supervisors' agenda. Operational risk, as our firms become bigger, more active and more successful, and employ the greater use of financial technology, this will be a growing area of focus for the regulator. In terms of oversight controls, this is where we look to see how management themselves are identifying, assessing, and mitigating their own risks. In terms of financial mitigation, this is the ability of a firm to absorb losses or deal with unexpected events. So that could be dealing with capital, liquidity, or additional parental shareholder support. Next slide, please. Here are just some an illustration of the key FSRA requirements in terms of our Gen and Peru rulebook. Obviously, you expect firms to have risk management systems and controls, appropriate policies and procedures. And the last one I wanted to draw your attention because we expect all firms in a proportionate manager to undertake an operational risk assessment. And it's got to be linked to their products, activities, processes and systems. Again, the level and sophistication of this risk assessment will be dependent on the size and complexity of the firm. Next slide, please. Turning now to the IRAP and ICAP in terms of the internal risk assessment process and the internal capital adequacy process. So what are these documents? Their purpose is to assess and demonstrate the adequacy of a firm's capital and management framework. In terms of their scope, it's quite ranging in terms of the categories of authorised persons. The format, there is no set format, but should be a living standalone document which is for the benefit and purpose and reporting, not only to the regulator, but to the firm's governing body. Although there's net, no set format, the type of uh, report formats that I've seen encompass an executive summary, a background to the firm, the business strategy, financial and capital position, the actual risk assessment, capital planning and stress testing, perhaps liquidity, challenge and review of the documents, and how the IRAP-ICAP will be used. 
So there's quite a bit of overlap between the IOF and ICAP, but the ICAP is a more comprehensive document with a stronger focus on capital assessment on stress testing. In terms of submission, it should be four months from the end of a firm's financial year, which for most firms in AGM will be at the end of April. Next slide, please. However, the IRAP and ICAP is not a requirement for category four branches who still need to maintain adequate systems controls. So how does this affect our large population of branches? So first of all, risk management should be proportionate to the nature, scale, and complexity of the business. However, FSOA would look when we're actually conducting engagements and visits with firms, we would inquire and look for understanding of the risks to the firm's business plan and strategy. We would expect a compliance risk assessment, also operational risk assessment, also look at an AML handbook, the business risk assessment, and particularly where branches are uh, part of a, a wider group, we will look for a traceability and assessment between the A to GM entity risks and the group risks where these are relevant. Next slide, please. So risk framework. Here's an illustration of key components of a risk framework. Obviously, the, you could do a presentation on each of those components. So I'm just going to give a high-level overview and illustration of each. First of all, there should be board and senior management oversight engagement. There should be a risk assessment methodology which details how you are going to identify, assess and manage your risks. A risk taxonomy. This is a set of standard risks at various levels which would help with the risk assessment process. Risk appetite statements. These are statements of areas that you will or will not do conduct business. Some of this might be clear in terms of AML sanctions, or types of business you will want to onboard. But an important fact about risk appetite statements is that you have to understand your risk exposures and how your risk exposures could change under different scenarios. The next is risk culture, and I'll be talking about that in the next couple of slides. Obviously, there's policies and procedures and risk limits. And importantly, is management information reporting systems. And here it's important that the risk exposures are kept up to date in terms of valuation. For example, uh, in the UK, I know of one institution that had not updated its real estate valuation for more than three years, which is out of line of the UK regulatory expectations at that time. Obviously, there's controls and insurance activities to ensure that the risk framework is actually effective and training to raise awareness on people's responsibilities in this area. Next slide, please. So, why have I included risk culture? So there's two key dynamics to risk. There's the quantitative element in terms of risk appetite statements, key risk indicators, limits, models, and stress testing. But an important part, part of risk is actually the qualitative in terms of the human decisions that are made in terms of risk. So what is risk culture? These are the norms of behavior of individuals with an organization that can shape and determine their ability to understand and deal with risk. So why does it matter? As a regulator, we believe the firm's culture has an effect on its financial condition, its interaction with customers and market counterparties. Quite often, a lot of firms now are undertaking risk culture assessments, which can provide a useful tool to assess the progress, effectiveness and understanding of risk management within an organization. It's a key determinant whether a firm will be successful in its execution of a strategy within its defined risk appetite. And as a regulator, we see weaknesses as in risk culture are often considered a root cause of risk and compliance events and issues. Next slide, please. So what is a good risk culture? Here are some of the things we would consider or look for when we're conducting our engagements or inspections with a, with a firm. It's the tone from the top, accountability, communication challenge, and incentives. So here it's about promoting a healthy skepticism, senior management being open to challenge, and also the visible behavior of senior management in terms of risk. An important aspect is the firm's values, how they've been communicated, understood, and embedded. Often this requires 
multiple repetitions to ensure that all staff understand the expectations. When we're engaging with a firm, we will ask about the firm's understanding and key senior management's understanding of where they see the key risks in their business lines and business operations. A firm is important, issues and mistakes will happen, but it's important these are not repeated and lessons are learned. There should be ownership of risk, clearly articulated, whistleblowing procedures, and staff um, on the ground often have a very good realistic opinion on where risk actually occurs in practice. In terms of the control functions, do they operate independently and have the ability to challenge the business? In some jurisdictions, the control functions in terms of a risk division or compliance division have a veto on the level of business, level of a bonus for a business. Remuneration, compensation that supports the firm's values and promotes sound risk behavior. In some organizations I've seen, they have risk gateways where even though you exceed your sales targets, if you fail to miss, miss the risk objectives, sometimes a bonus is actually taken away from a member of staff. Next slide, please. Turning now to the theme of risk culture, um, I want to explore the issue of behavioral economics. This is human side of risk decisions. So what is behavioral economics? It is a study and use of psychological factors which affects the decision making of individuals and organizations. And for many regulators around the world, they're paying more attention to behavioral economics. For example, the FCA uses behavioral economics and has issued several papers as they see it as a good predictor of conduct risk. Also, behavioral economics has been used in many years in terms of marketing and selling to customers. So I just want to pick out a few examples of where this can happen. So why, do, why are we concerned about behavioral economics? It's because not everyone actually conducts decisions or decision makings in a rational manner. Sometimes we are prone to mistakes, tiredness, stress, pressure, biases and prejudices. So it's important to recognize that in our decision making. So the first example is groupthink. This is a sense where you get a collective, usually a board or senior management, who have the same background, gender, ethnicity, education, and they tend to think in the same manner. This creates a, an illusion of vulnerability, extreme optimism, and ignore facts and science dissent. And this is often linked to confirmation bias, where new information is forced to fit into existing views. This is seen as one of the key drivers behind the financial crisis of 2008. The next one is blindness of dominant logic, where successful strategies become embedded and represent the dominant logic over time. However, nothing stands still in business, and this can limit the ability of management to drive innovation or see new opportunities or threats. Again, this is prevalent before the financial crisis in 2008, where many firms are very, very successful in terms of profit and expansion. There was a view at that time that the market had been tamed in terms of the use of derivatives and securitization to spread the risk across the market. Bystander effect is quite common in the larger organizations where a group of people fail to act because of uncertainty and a reduction in personal responsibility. In an organization, this can lead to a silo mentality where risk cuts across different areas, but there's uncertainty on the responsibilities between stakeholders. So for example, I once gave a risk assessment presentation as a regulator to a medium-sized bank in the UK, and I went through all their key risks. Um, the board agreed on my assessment, but they asked me a question in terms of what did I think was the one key risk they should focus on. My reply, which was endorsed by the board, was to consider the risk in combination because risks do not happen in isolation. There's usually a consequential impact on, from one risk to another area. Next slide, please. So now I want to pick through some of the key themes from our reviews of the ICAP and IRAP from either inspection visits or reviews of the annual submissions. 
And these are divided into the areas that we will focus on in terms of our review of these documents. First of all, business model and strategy. I think quite often there's a lack of a clear articulation of a business profile, strategy, and how a firm will deliver that strategy. And we would expect to see more commentary and articulation on the macro environment and how the firm fits within that macro environment and its potential effect on its strategy. In terms of governance and review, there's often a lack within a report of a commentary and review by the governing body. This is an important aspect we expect to see in these documents. Again, this is not just a document for the regulator, it's a document for the firm and its governing body. Sometimes a process for the oversight and review is not articulated. Sometimes there's limited evidence of an independent review and challenge and validation. So that could be from internal audit or independent risk division. On occasions, there's a lack of an effective summary for the governing body. These can be quite complicated and detailed documents. So it's important that the key aspects and the key highlights and the key actions are actually summarized for the board. Next slide, please. In terms of methodology, uh, the, the approach to undertake the IRAP ICAP assessment sometimes is not articulated. And the methodology, including the assumptions for the projections used and the allowances and deductions that are outlined in PRU and the PRU rule references, are not often stated. Quite a few firms provide a good summary of the calculations and the steps taken to that, but, but on occasion, other firms do not provide supporting calculations. On a risk basis, sometimes a regulator will look at the calculations and try to follow those calculations to see how the underlying figures were derived. Most firms have a pretty good summary of the capital position and requirement. We've observed some errors in the calculations. That's why it's important to get uh, an independent uh, validation and check. And occasionally, very occasionally, some firms have difficulty in finding the operational risk calculations where they've been in existence for less than three years. Next slide, please. Risk framework and assessments. Uh, quite often firms had a good use of established risk taxonomy and a risk register. Many, few, many firms use scoring grids in terms of inherent versus mitigation and impact versus probability to produce an overall assessment. Again, sometimes it's not clear where the group risks uh, differ to the AGM entity, where this is a branch or subsidiary, and these often need greater definition and assessment. Quite a few firms have developed risk appetite statements, but, of, but on occasions we haven't seen them operationalize into key risk indicators and limits. Often in risk assessment, we see AML risk, credit, liquidity, market risk, conduct risk, but a couple of risks we don't often see is business risk, reputation, and outsourcing. Management actions are not specified where risk is outside of appetite. So often we see an assessment which is scored as high, but sometimes we don't see what the management actions are to deal with this risk and the pathway to green. Next slide, please. Stress and scenario testing. I think it's probably one area that needs the greatest improvement in terms of the ICAP and IRAP. Um, we've seen a limited range of plausible but stretching stresses and scenarios. This is the ability of a firm to absorb capital, access funding and contingency funding should a shock event occur. They need to apply these stress and scenario testings to performance, to capital and to projections. And on occasion, the approach, output and assessment is sometimes not provided. In terms of the use and embedding, um, I think few firms have articulated how the reports be used as an ongoing business and capital planning. This should be a live issue, a living document for the firm, and should be used on a regular basis, not just annually, but when there's a new product, a new business line, or a new event has occurred. Sometimes we see the risk management policy and an ICAP IRAP policy, and sometimes there's a difference or disconnect between the two. Next slide, please. So here we've articulated some IRAP, ICAP, do's and don'ts and tries, some useful tips in terms of preparation of your next documentation. Um, 
Consider including risks you've identified but have not assessed as material. Again, engage at staff at all levels to ensure you've got the right insights to how, this, how risk is actually running in practice. Ensure that it's aligned to periodic and ad hoc risk reporting that goes to the senior management and board. And be forward looking. So, for example, when a regulator reviews uh, EPRS returns, we not only look at the current state of meeting the regulatory requirements, but we also try to project forward in terms of current loss rate and how that might impact capital in the next three and six months. Don't use this as a showpiece exercise. You should, you should devote time and it should be more than two months before it is submitted. So when a supervisor asks for this document, you shouldn't say that we're just working on it. It should be a living document and ready to be submitted when requested. It's useful to have a senior individual who is knowledgeable and owns the document and owns the process. And this is a learning exercise as well. So you might get, not get your IRAP, your first IRAP or ICAP perfect at the first go, but use this as a learning experience to develop an in-house expertise. Next slide, please. So in terms of key takeaways, um, our view is that firms have a primary responsibility for the management of their risks. It's important to define your risk appetite in terms of risks you will undertake or not undertake, but this requires an understanding of your risks and different risk scenarios. Risk management is different for each firm and should be proportionate to the nature, scale and complexity, but should be robust and effective. Does it actually help in terms of identification and mitigation of your risks? Culture and behaviour is a key driver. And also important to remember, this is an aid to business performance to help firms avoid, manage, mitigate financial losses, loss of consumer trust, business of interruption, reputational damage and resilience to external events. The ICAP IRAP is a key tool to demonstrate both to the regulator and internally to your own governing body whether you've got the adequacy of capital and risk management to deliver the objectives and your business plans. And often risk does not operate in isolation. You should consider for any risk event its causes and wider effects. Thank you. That draws it. The close and now we'll move on to the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, for the very comprehensive presentation. Um, I think I found a part of behavioral economics especially fascinating, so thanks for that. So that brings us to the Q&A session where Darren and myself from the FSRA supervision team are joined by John Carroll from the FSRA policy team. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them into the website and we will try our best to answer your questions today. So let's see what we have. So we have a question on, on stress testing. So I think um, I might post this to, to Darren. So the question is, for, for stress testing and scenarios, what are the stresses and scenarios that we can use? Um, Darren, you want to give that a shot? Okay, thanks, HP. Um, in terms of stress and scenario tests, it's important to remember what outcome we're seeking to achieve. So obviously, a business is supposed to be ambitious in its growth plans, but obviously, in reality, these plans don't actually meet expectations. Also, you're looking to see the ability for a business to absorb its losses, resilience to events and to determine the capacity and flexibility in the business plan. So let's take the stress and scenario testing. Stress testing is a quantitative sensitivity analysis that will change a certain number in terms of growth or percentage of expenses. In terms of scenarios, we can look at uh, a combination of events, both historical and hypothetical. So example historical could be the financial crisis, the 1980s recession in the UK, or perhaps a lost decade in the 1990s for Japan. Obviously, you can also do a longer term uh, stress test in terms of longer, lower interest rates. And then you could use um, a reverse stress testing, which is a technique to see what combination of events or stresses would actually mean the collapse of the business. And you can look at that from your projections, from your capital, from your expenses, revenue, and even staff resources. Obviously, once you 
once you've completed the stress test, you should look back to see whether um, in due course reality has matched the stresses. Big part is the management action. So if a stress test reveals certain vulnerabilities, what would be the management actions that you could or would take in such an event? Thank you. Thanks, Darren. I think um, we were living in very interesting times of many black swan or grey swan events. We had COVID, interest rate hikes, and then uh, now, now the war. So I think the scenarios are constantly evolving. So, so thanks for that. Um, another question. So does a firm need a dedicated risk officer or a risk manager? Um, so hiring a risk officer is not a mandatory appointment, unlike that for an SEO or a CEO, a compliance officer, MLRO, or a finance um, officer. So it largely depends, I guess, on the risk profile, the size and complexity of business activities of a firm. So I, we, we have seen instances of firms that have a dedicated risk officer and firms that don't. And it's worked, uh, it can work well either way. Um, some firms that they view themselves as having more complex risk profiles, they have a dedicated risk officer. Um, usually it's in-house. Um, we, we have seen instances of where they outsource the risk function to, to an outsource firm. So, so that is possible as well. Um, so it really depends on, on the firm's um, risk profile. And, and you also have firms that um, do not have a dedicated risk officer at all because they feel that their business model tends to be simpler. Say you're a cat for branch, as, as um, Darren covered just now. So there's no one size fits all um, approach. So so we don't mandate this. Um, but if you're if you're worrying or wondering whether your firm needs a risk officer, um, have a chat with us if you need to, uh, and then we'd be happy to discuss this with you. Okay, this next question, um, I might give this to you, John, if you may. Um, what roles do senior management and the governing body of a firm, um, that is the board of directors, what do they play in risk management? Um, thanks, H.P. Uh, Darren covered this in, in the presentation and uh, certainly from experience uh, in sitting on threat panels and so on and so forth. You know, I know that it's critical that senior management, the board as well, they actually have knowledge of the, the whole, not the whole risk profile, but certainly the highlights of it and how it's evolving over time. Um, it's not sufficient for them to say, oh, don't worry, risk management, take care of that, or compliance, or you know, somebody else is doing the BCP planning. Um, they actually set you know, the whole risk culture, which percolates down the organization, and they themselves you know, are subject to actually you know, seeing that it's actually observed. Um, in terms of something critical like risk appetites, that shouldn't just be a statement that's set, you know, once in a tablet of stone and, and reviewed perhaps annually every two years. It should actually be, uh, you know, judged in terms of the business strategy and as much as the business strategy is re reviewed and updated um, on a periodic basis, so too should be the risk appetite and the ongoing operations of the institution judged against that. Is this particular uh, new line of business we're thinking about, is that within our risk appetite or outside it? Um, if we feel we want to take it on, then the risk appetite will need revision as well. Um, as much as saying that the senior management and governing body, you know, they own the risk appetite culture and um, its uh, impact on strategy, I think certainly, it, and coming back to your point about a separate risk manager, um, HB, that question, uh, something like operational risk is uh, a critical uh, component of the risk profile of you know, most firms, uh, in fact, probably all of them. It's important to know that uh, it's, it's important to have local risk managers. You know, things that are seen, they should be observed and escalated as appropriate, um, assessed, material or not, and thereby um, incorporated into the IRA and or the ICAP if that's undertaken as well. But certainly the, uh, the, the tone from the top is something that you can't overestimate. Um, it, it sets the, uh, you know, the uh, operations of the entity and also it means that you know, there's no local risk appetite, risk taking um, outside that risk appetite that might potentially endanger the firm. Thanks. Thank you, John. Okay, we now have some questions on IRAP and ICAP. So I might give this to you, Darren. So the question is, uh, please can you describe what you, what you look for in um, an ICAP or an IRAP? Is there a specific format and, and what are the differences given that they, they do overlap? Um, Darren, you want to give this a go? Yeah, sure. Thank you. 
Uh, so there are commonalities between the IRAP and ICAM. Well, I see the ICAM as a more comprehensive document. So if you see the scope of firms which is captured for an ICAM, they tend to have more balance sheet assets and liabilities. So we're looking for a more in-depth assessment of the capital and potential loss and potential risks from the balance sheet. In terms of the specific format, I think ideally this primarily should be a document for the firm itself. So it should set um, the format and what it sees as the key parameters. Um, there's lots of guides on, on the internet that you can look at, but the common formats I see is an executive summary where you highlight the key aspects, the key risks and the key capital position and the key actions for the governing body. Then you would give a background to the firm, how is it set up? <coughs> its business model, what is its strategy, then more depth in terms of the business strategy, the plan, the ambitions, the growth, then a section on financial and capital position, including stress tests, then a risk assessment in terms of what risks were identified, how have they been mitigated, what are risk management actions, how are they scored, capital planning and stress tests is important as well. For some firms, liquidity is, is an important feature in terms of uh, cash flow, ensuring they have enough uh, you know, assets to meet their liabilities. And then the challenge and review. So what's the process for the challenge and review of the ICAP? Uh, did the government body review it? Did they make comments? Did risk management make comments? Was it reviewed by internal audit? And actually, we expect those commentary and approval and assessment to be within the body of the document. And then lastly, how will the ICAP or be used in the business? It shouldn't be a one-off event. It should be a standalone living document uh, that should be refreshed periodically in terms of when material events or, or key changes happen to the business. Thank you. Thanks much, Darren. Okay, and um, I think we might have yeah, time for the... Sorry, John. I was just going to... I was just going to add to that HB. Darren touched upon something there: assets and liability, liquidity as well is you know, a critical component around this that we need to look at. Um, and just from a policy perspective, I think you know it's important to know that capital is the last line of defence. You know, the emphasis has got to be on internal systems and controls that are appropriate for the organisation, proportionate as well. Capital is there to observe losses on an ongoing basis, but. Uh, you know, critical crystallization of risk um, will take a firm down the matter of its capital price. Thanks, H. Thanks, John. And John, you spoke just now about the, the board of directors and senior management governing body. So we do have a question sort of related to that, that, that someone has asked, you know, is an FI, do they have to, can the risk committee be outsourced or partly outsourced or formed uh, at, at a group level? Um, yeah, happy if you could give that a shot, John. Yeah. This, this comes back HB to ownership of the risk. Um, out, you know, you can certainly outsource some functions, you know, um, in the regulatory environment, and you know, we, have, we accommodate that as well within our regulatory framework. Um, when it comes down to, uh, you know, ultimately things like uh, outsourcing is a good example. You know, a regulated firm can't transfer responsibility for that to a third party. You know. The supervisor will actually make sure that they are, you know, effectively uh, the owner of that, and there's no way that it can be turned around and said, you know, the outsourced service provider they should have known better. You know, there's an oversight uh, aspect there as well, a critical uh, knowledge of what the service provider is doing, how well they're doing it, and so on. And the same, I think, can be said around risk management. That outsourcing a risk management um, function, you know, can be done, but effectively ownership of the risk must reside with the officers or the entity, the authorised entity. Um, I think certainly in terms of uh, a risk committee, um, that should certainly have a significant involvement, if, if not sole involvement, of uh, uh, employees of the authorised institution, um, potentially with the outsourced uh, risk management service, you know, providing the uh, presentations, the information, the analysis and so on, but decisions to be made have to be taken by those officers of the authorised entity. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you John. I think, uh, I think I'd add to that, HB, I think in terms of uh, group versus local risk committee, um, I think it depends on the nature, scale, complexity of the business in the NGGM, but you have to bear in mind sometimes these risk committees at group level will have to Pine and review risk across the whole number of branches or entities they're responsible for. So it's a question of the visibility and focus of a risk according to the AGM and how much focus that would get at a sort of bigger uh, group risk committee level. Yes, yeah, it's, it's about, as Darren says, it's about local ownership of those risks. 
if they're not material at a group level, they may still be tremendously material for the ADGM uh, entities. That's right. Yeah, local knowledge and, and taking ownership, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I think we might have time for just uh, one last question, so I think we can all chip in. So this is a more general question. Uh, what methods can we use to assess risk? Uh, so where, where do we start? Well, I guess the, the starting point is is the business strategy and then plan and the risk appetite. So that's always the starting point. If you don't understand your business model, your strategy, you don't set your risk appetite, you know, then the, the risk management framework cannot flow down from there. Um, yeah, Darren, John, feel free to chip in. How can we, what methods can we use to assess risk? I think it's a combination of things. I think you need some sort of framework to provide a foundation, and that could be your risk management framework, or if it's an established framework uh, from a group, sometimes they can provide the risk assessment methodology or standard risk taxonomy. A lot of it also is use of MI for looking at errors, near misses, losses, um, Reggie actions, Reggie guidance, what's been happening in the environment. But a lot of the times it's a workshop environment where groups at different levels and different experiences come together to form a common view of risk. And sometimes it, it takes many sort of iterations and workshops to produce a sort of a final risk assessment. Yeah. I'll just add to Darren, um, Darren's views on that. that um, yeah, I think transparency across the organisation of the risk framework is critical. You know, you may have local um, risks that are, are specifically uh, identified and assessed by somebody, but uh, ultimately they've got to be collated uh, centrally and looked at. I'd also stress that, you know, I, I've certainly back in uh, my previous experience, too much of a reliance on quantitative methods is, is not so good. Um, Risk is really a qualitative, uh, you know, has a great qualitative overlay, but, uh, you know, people will see the direction of travel for an organisation before, you know, any sort of model or uh, risk rating will actually um, highlight it as being a risk. So I'd, I'd certainly emphasise the qualitative aspects of risk management. That's right, John. That's the, the global financial crisis has shown an over-reliance on, on quant models. Where did that bring us? <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Great. Okay, I think we are we're out of time. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. So we thank you for attending this and we hope you found it useful. And, and hopefully you found some um, useful pointers when thinking about your firm's uh, risk management framework. So if as an authorized firm, you have any additional questions regarding your risk management um, processes, systems and controls, you're welcome to reach out to the FSRA through the usual channels. Um, and with that, um, we thank you and we wish you a great week ahead. Thank you. Thank you.